Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to Trust and Believe. I'm your host, Shanti, and I'm smiling because I'm in a room full of incredible people. This podcast is a live podcast with people from my Unity community. And if you don't know the Unity community, which used to be the safe space, which also has a safe space element, is a community that I have on Facebook, which I would love for you all to join if possible. But it's just a group of people who come into a space, a non-judgmental space, a space where we can talk about anything, be anything, uh, share anything, and not feel like you're going to be judged. You know, right now we're around the holiday season and we're going into the new year. And I was just having this conversation when I was at the IV therapy place. I go to this restore place where you can get IV therapy, infrared sauna, cryotherapy. But anyway, I was having a conversation with the nurse there and we were just talking about how the holidays bring around so much anxiety and angst for a few different reasons. One, family. I remember growing up and I used to think that Every other house on the street had this incredible family. They had more money. So everything must have been really fine and dandy in their homes. And then not till I grew up and I started talking to friends that grew up around me that I realized that so many people have all these issues and they're just not talked about. And so the nurse and I were talking about how the holiday season from Thanksgiving all the way through the new year there's so many families that come together and play like, oh my gosh, it's a holiday, but every family has drama. And it made me feel really normal. So I thought that was really interesting. But also we just kind of started talking about going into the new year and how we carry a lot of baggage. And it's just kind of like this crazy snowball effect that starts happening around the holiday season because you feel the pressure of being with family, you feel the pressure of spending money, you feel the pressure of, I don't know, going into the new year and trying to like start to live this perfect life because it's supposed to be fresh and new. Oh, and then we also talked about social media and how like the world has become this place of judgment now that everybody has a stage, you know, we all have a page or a, an account or whatever, and we post what we want and we're just out there living our best lives and we have this stage. And instead of it being like you go to a musical or a movie, even though not everybody likes the musical they're seeing or the movie that they're watching, there's this kind of like universal respect when people walk into a theater of any sort and they just kind of respect what they're seeing and they talk about it later. Like, yeah, maybe I didn't like that or this is what I liked about it and whatever. And while we all have these stages that we have on social media, our platforms, you know, it's just so much rudeness going on in the world. So I say all that to say that, you know, the holiday season we have, you know, we don't sometimes want to be around family because we feel like we're being judged. And in our own social media platforms, we feel like we're being judged. And so we go into the new year and we try to find this perfect life. And I think one of the things that gets looked over is how to actually transform into the new year, because we just kind of say, I have this new year resolution and this is what I'm going to do. But I don't think a lot of people take time to think about the ramp up, if you will, like that blending effect. One of the things that I love to do when I edit videos is the transitions and TikTok has some cool transitions, but in regular video editing, there's like the crossfade, right? And it's kind of like everybody, you know, there's this like really sometimes amazing transition when you're watching movies or films or video, and it just seems seamless. And I don't think that we as people, when we're going into a new year and building our new year's resolutions, I don't think we create seamless transitions for ourselves because I think we just are so quickly wanting to experience what it is that we want to be new and we want to reach that goal. And so in this podcast specifically, you know, we're live here tonight. And so the questions that I'm going to answer, while they may have some definitive answers to them, and I might have that, I think I'm going to focus more on how to focus on transitioning into the answer rather than taking the answer and running with it. Because I've seen a lot of people speak on stage and they give these like incredible truth bombs, which I do, or like these powerful statements and people, their eyes light up and they, 
oh my gosh, that sounded so amazing. And it feels good in the moment, but nobody really knows how to get there. They just hear that this is what you do. So tonight, I'm going to answer some questions or today or whenever you're listening to this podcast or watching. Somebody say hey, yeah. no, no, no. What's up? Better than Oprah. Come on, y'all. This is Sean T, and it's time to trust and believe. So, welcome everyone here. Thank you so much. But I'm going to answer this first question, and it is actually really, really great because it's something that I personally am suffering with right now. So, the first question is. Sean, how does Scott handle your struggles when it comes to your anxiety? It's been such a prominent thing that's been happening in our household because I think I'm just lucky that I have a spouse that has been to therapy. He's older. He's been in situations where he's been really stressed and he's very well aware of his own stress and he is very in tune with me and we have a relationship where we don't have to hide anything. We promise each other, we never lie to each other, no matter how much it's gonna hurt, no matter how much it's gonna you know, make us clutch our pearls. As I like to say, we tell the truth. So we had that foundation. However, I will say that being the person in the, in the relationship that suffers more from anxiety, I don't think he suffers from anxiety at all, to be quite honest. But the person that suffers the most with mental health, it can get a little tough because you kind of feel like you're overbearing or in the beginning of me and Scott's relationship, you know, he used to, you know, say I was emotional and he was logical. And it was kind of like this negative connotation on being an emotional person. And so we had to kind of work through that to get to where we are now so that he actually understands how I'm feeling and I understand how he's feeling and how he processes things. But to get to the meat of the question, one of the things that I have to do myself before I do invite Scott into my anxiety space is in the best way I know how to know what it is that I'm going through. And if I don't know what I'm going through, I have to know what I'm feeling. And if I don't know what I'm feeling, I have to know and admit that I'm overwhelmed and I have to be okay with the fact that I'm overwhelmed. I do all of that before I even approach him with whatever it is that I'm struggling with. And I think for me, that helps me transform from being a person who is struggling to a person who is okay asking for help from my spouse. And so to kind of answer the first part of that question, if you're somebody who suffers from anxiety or depression or any kind of stress or worry, even kind of do a self audit so that when you go to your spouse or to your friend or said person that you're going to speak to, unless it's a therapist, you can go to a therapist and sit there and cry for 30 minutes. And they're just, they're going to be, they're going to read into everything. But I think it's important for us to do the job of kind of knowing how we feel or not knowing how we feel or not being able to place an emotion on it. Because it, sometimes I don't know how I feel. I'm just like, I'm just so overwhelmed. And I'm able to verbalize, I'm going to start crying right now. <laughs> like I'm going to start crying right now. And so that's my transformation into being able to talk to Scott. And so the fact that I'm able to do that create such an open door policy, if you will, for his ability to accept what I'm going through. But in addition to that, for my ability to be open to how he is going to interpret what I'm saying. And it's also going to allow me to accept his response to it. Because before if I would go to him and I was suffering from anxiety and I would be all up in this crazy tornado, if you will, I would be in a way defensive because I feel less than because I'm the person that has a problem. And so no matter how he perceived it, received it, interpreted it, 
I was in a space of being defensive. So it didn't even matter if he was supportive or not. I was already to a point where I felt so vulnerable that I wasn't going to be able to accept his ability to process it anyway. But now, if you really want to get to the other side, now, which is like really cool, is he's able to pick up on those moments where I'm going through something and it helps so much. Oh my gosh. It helps so much because he's able to read it. And so when I come to him, sometimes he doesn't say I know, but I know he knows because I don't think he wants me to feel that I was overwhelming the room because I think that's one of the things that happens to me is if I feel like I feel that way, then I feel like I'm a downer. It's a whole thing. Now we just talk about it. He does a really great job of asking me how I feel. You know, sometimes he's also able to say, hey, I'm going to give the kids the iPad right now so we can go talk and we'll tell our kids, hey, guys, sit on the couch, either play with your Legos, watch your iPad, pop in that I have to have a conversation. And so he handles it really well in short, but it's not short because it really starts with me and because I know it's my my journey, my mental health journey, I think every time I suffer from an anxious moment or anxiety or some sort of stress or worry, it is a journey that I have to go through. And so we just really set aside time to deal with it as much as we can. One of the things that I've noticed is that a lot of my anxiety comes at a time where I'm about to leave home. It's kind of one of those things that, you know, he picks up on it. Another thing that Scott picked up on a while ago, and I was like, what are you talking about? Because I didn't even know. He would tell me every time before I would have a live event, he would be like, you would be so stressed. But I wouldn't even know I was stressed. He would be like, you're stressed, you're anxious, you get sick. He's like, you get sick, you get a stomach ache, you get all this stuff. I didn't even realize that there was this kind of rotating stress that I had right before live events. And so when he told me that, I was like, oh my goodness. So now before live events, I get massages. I do all these things that allow me to calm my brain and not stress because it's not, I'm not, I'm excited about the live events, but also, you know, it's a lot because I don't just go into my live events just being like, oh, I'm gonna go on stage. You know, it's a really heightened emotional thing for me to see a lot of people that over the years I've gotten to know. And a lot of you out there are my extended family. So it's kind of a family reunion. And then I know what you're going through. And you all know that I purposely take on some of your struggles because that's what I'm here for. Right. So I just didn't realize that prior to that event or these events that I actually had a stressful way of dealing with it. And so now I'm able to deal with it. And I say all that to say, please continue to come to the events. I have a much better way to deal with it now and I feel really good. All right, I'm gonna go to the next question. What are your thoughts to build momentum toward habits from Brandt? Oh, that's a really great question. And uh, when we talk about building momentum, it fits right into what we're talking about tonight, which is transforming into something. There's a lot of things I can talk about when it comes to building momentum. You know, when it comes to nutrition and fitness and weight loss, and I roll my eyes only because that's, it's a really tough thing for everyone. It goes into what I talked about before. And this is somebody that's been in the transformation space for about 25 years now. People just want it too fast. I'm a very impatient person at heart. I've gotten so much better over the last 11 years <laughs> that I've been with Scott, but I just wanted things too fast. And so when we think about building momentum, we have to think about that is exactly what it is. I think I did a podcast years ago entitled Rome wasn't built in a day. And I think we have to tell ourselves that every morning when we wake up, we do have a goal. We do have a job, right? If your boss is like, I need to get this done by end of day. Great. When I go and I shoot my body workouts, I know that I have two workouts to complete at the end of the day. And I know it has to get there, but there's always a process to get there. Even though I develop my workouts here and I've rehearsed my workouts probably like eight times before I get to the stage. The process for me leaving home here in Arizona, getting to LA, filming it and finishing it is a whole process. 
I leave here. If I'm on a plane, I'm listening to music. I'm looking at my notes. Not only am I looking at my notes, but I'm also, because it's not a live event and I can't feel people in the space, I come up with a message. Then I get to my hotel. I usually go down and have dinner and an old fashioned and I keep my AirPods in and I'm going through all four of my workouts that I'm going to do and I'm over and over again. And then so when I wake up in the morning on the day of the workout, I practice the first workout I'm going to do. Then I get there. I practice it again. Then I shoot it. And as soon as I leave stage, I leave. I put my AirPods in. I practice the next workout. And so I'm constantly building momentum for when I get to the live show. And so it all started at each workout that I develop starts with an idea. And it starts with an idea of how am I going to make this different? How am I going to make this unique? Because there's only a certain amount of push-ups and squats and you know, that you can do. How do I build this workout so that I get to not only build it, but practice it, come up with a message, perform it and, and perfect it as much as possible. Cause I always mess up. It's just a part of me. It's funny too. So I think that when you talk about building momentum and, and transforming into the new year, I think one of the things that is really frustrating is when people are like, I want a million dollars in my bank account, but they don't really do anything to really feel like save the money that they have or try to save the money that they have if they can because stuff is expensive now or take a class on investing. Or if you hang with my friend, Steve, you know, he talks about Bitcoin, him and Darren, my friend, Darren, you know, like what are all the things that you can do to help get to that million dollars, but not just be like, I'm going to get a million dollars and something more than, you know, I'm going to work all day. Right. It's like, you have to, when building momentum requires you to build knowledge as well. I didn't get to where I am in the world of fitness by just teaching one class. You know, I didn't get really good at teaching dance by doing one choreography. I did choreography. I practiced it on my off time. And so when we talk about building momentum, when we talk about building habits, you have to do those habits in the off time. Let's talk about food, for instance. You know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner is one thing. But when you're not eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner, this is why a lot of people food prep or they go to the grocery store and they buy snacks that are healthier, right? So you're building habits outside of just the moments in time where you're supposed to take action. So that's the best I can do now for it to be a habit like me and fitness and weight loss. I don't stress about it really anymore ever. And it kind of just happened over the last year and a half because I'm like, it is what it is. I know what to do. I built enough knowledge in my mind and enough knowledge in my body and enough knowledge in my spoon to know the habits that I have to build to continue to look the way that I want to look, feel the way that I want to feel. And that is by just doing it and practicing and, and kind of digging deep and going above and above and beyond so that you can build those healthy habits. What is your best advice for making mental health a priority? Therapy. Therapy. You have to almost treat mental health like you treat your workout, like you treat brushing your teeth, hopefully you do, or flossing, hopefully you do, or taking a shower, hopefully you do. You have to, you have to treat your mental health like that. The only thing that's different with mental health and, and therapy, well, if you do therapy like better help, um, online therapy is different. It's you kind of have more access, right? Immediate access, if you will. But when it comes to traditional therapy, for me, it was committing. When I first started therapy, I committed to two times a week. I went to therapy, I think it was Tuesday and Thursday. And then as I started to really, you know, really learn about myself and go home with the exercises that my therapist gave me, then I, then I went to once a week and I believe it was every Wednesday. So you have to make it a priority by prioritizing it like you prioritize everything else. It has to be like a workout. It has to be, if you want to lose weight, it has to be very similar to how you treat yourself with nutrition. The other thing that will help make it a priority, which is why we have groups like the Unity community, is having accountability, right? I have a great husband that keeps me accountable. I have great friends that I talk to about 
my mental health or your doctor or whatever, but you also have to build a force field of positivity around you of people who are going to check in, you know, being around people, if you tell them, Hey, I've been really stressed and they're like, Oh, you know, I hope you feel better. And they never ask about it again. While they may be a good friend of yours or a friend, they may not be a person that you need to share your mental health issues with because they may not be, be those people that help make it a priority. So kind of be around people or even in this group, or if you have friends in your life, you know, people make a book club, make a mental health club, you know, just having people around you that are definitely going to check in because those people, just like an exercise, if you say, Hey, I worked out today, you know, you have your friends that do it with your Apple watch, if you have one or any kind of, you know, tracking device, you know, you can go back and forth and be like, yeah, you worked out today, or you have a, a workout partner or somebody you can call and be like, Hey, how are you doing? So I think in order to make it a priority, you have to prioritize it. Like you do everything else in your life. But the last thing I'll say is I know people who are much older than myself who have never been to therapy because they're afraid of opening up Pandora's box. If you will, they're afraid of reliving that past. They're afraid of revisiting that past. And so I just think it's very, very important that you in some way try to overcome the fear. And in this case, you know, we always say fear is false evidence appearing real. Well, in this case, the fear is something that you experience if we are talking specifically about your past. And so I think it's really important that you have to overcome that fear and step by step. Because one of the things with fear is when you feel like you're going to revisit your past is you feel like it's all going to come crashing down. Usually in therapy, it doesn't come back to you all at once. You know, I'll tell you this, and I can't say who, but a few weeks ago, I did, maybe it was a couple months ago, but I did a, a post in a reel on just my molestation story. And I had multiple people and someone very close to me say, I was molested when I was younger and I forgot that it happened to me. And they were like, your, your post on, I think they may have seen it on Instagram, but they were like, your post made me remember. And they were like, specifically because they looked at me as a very strong person. And they were like, oh my God, I can't believe that happened to him. And then they had a breakdown to their wife and they were like, oh my gosh, this happened to me too. And they forgot about it. And so a lot of times people suppress so much stuff that they don't even remember. So when you go to therapy, you just have to know you're going to start talking. And even myself, like I thought it was more about the molestation that was the bigger thing. And a big part of it was that I just didn't know how to be loved or to receive love, you know, as an adult, that was huge. So try not to be fearful when you're making a priority, just know that it's not all going to come crashing down at one time. And then you'll have somebody there, a licensed professional, at least hopefully you do that, that will really help you navigate your way through. And the last thing I'll say, about therapy and making mental health a priority. And I think a good therapist will understand this. Therapy is almost like dating. Just because you walk into an office or talk to somebody, that therapist may not be for you. Just like when I was a personal trainer, if somebody didn't want to train with me or didn't take want to take my group exercise classes at the gym, I am completely fine with that. I'm, I'm more about you getting the results you want, then just sticking with me if I'm not the one to do it for you. So don't be afraid to shop around and make sure you find a therapist that's going to, you know, work for you. I would say most of the time I would give it like three sessions unless I just didn't, you know, me and my energy. If the energy wasn't great, I was like, peace out. Hopefully that helped. Next question. Aging is a transformation of sorts we go through. What thoughts do you have about aging? Oh my goodness. So, you know, minus the gray hairs that I have all over and some aching bones and joints, 
I never really gave aging a thought. I think it's because I'm so active. And I would love to have a story about, oh my gosh, you know, I struggle with aging, but I don't. And I think why is because I am so active. I stay young at heart all the time. I'm always laughing. I like spending time alone. I kind of have a day. I usually set up my day where I'm trying to enjoy it as much as possible. And I keep a youthful attitude. I laugh really loud. I'm probably loud. I'm sometimes the loudest laugher in a restaurant or I like to hang out with people and have a really good time. Also, the other thing on the flip side of that. So for people who are much older than me, sometimes I call, I've caught myself judging people the way they're acting, you know, because they're older. But then I immediately tell myself, I'm like, well, I'm not that age. So I have zero clue how they're processing life at the moment. And so I do think that people process age or their age differently, depending on their experience or what's happening in their life at that moment. So that's the other thing. But what's really great about aging is you don't sweat the small stuff as much. And if I can give you a really great example, and it's funny because Scott is six and a half years older than me. And, you know, literally when he was my age, I would see him looking at some of the things that I was stressed about. And he was like, oh my gosh, like I can't even, he was supportive, but he was like, I was like, would that stress you out? He's like, no. He's like, I think the older I get, I don't care. And now I'm 43 and I'm like, I don't even have time for that. And so one of the things that I think is really cool is having children. To them, you know, if, Sa if Sander is playing with Silas's Lego, this is like a big deal. It's like, Papa, you know, he's playing with my toy. And in my head, I'm like, so? I'm like, this is so trivial. Like, what? But to them, it's a huge deal. So, you know, I have to go to my head. And, and so I talk to them and I let them know, I'm like, you know, I know this is a really big deal to you. And it doesn't feel really great him playing with your things. Right. And so we kind of go through that thing. And then, you know, when kids get older and older, things become less and less and less and less important. But I think one of the good things with age is that you start to stress less about small stuff and, and more important things become more important and you give weight to that with your body. And I know you all do this, but not only exercise, but find exercise and mentally stimulating things that you can do and do them. This is why I love tennis so much. While it is physical, I just think it's such a great sport for my mentality because I love being aggressive. I love chasing things i love trying to figure things out and, and and tennis is like a chess match and so i really enjoy that so i think another thing when it comes to transforming into your age is start choosing to do things with your time that you really enjoy doing i think that will just eliminate so much stress in your life because you're taking time to do things that you want to do this question says, do you consider your anxiety as a weak part of who you are? Or do you take your anxiety, work through it, and then wear it as a piece of armor that protects you the next time you go through it? I used to look at it as a very weak thing. But now I personally feel like I have a platform and I have a voice to help people. And I think anytime you can utilize any struggle that you've been or are going through as a tool to help people, I think it just becomes, like you said, something that's fuel for people. It will help them push throughout their day. It'll help them feel better. But I think most importantly, when you are struggling with something and or me specifically anxiety, and I can talk about it and it helping people not feel like they're alone. I think that is just one of the most incredible things because a lot of times when we're going through something, we feel like it's only us that's going through it. And a lot of times other people are hiding it. Even as a young gay person, while I didn't experience being gay, the stress of being gay like Scott did, one of the joys of being gay is coming out because then when you come out, you start to feel other people come out. And so you don't feel alone anymore because when you're in a closet, even if you know other gay people are out there, or like I say, everybody's in a closet about something. When you're in the closet, you feel alone, period. You know, I feel really, really weird. I texted Jessica Nelson 
because whenever we're together, like we have this rule, you can text me anything weird. You can text me if you feel like you're going to cry. I text her pictures of me crying. <laughs> Anytime I'm crying, I'm like, this is so stupid. But I text a picture of her and I'm like, hey, I'm crying about this. And she's like, oh my gosh, this is so great. Even if it's horrible for me, you know, we have that moment where she's a person that doesn't think crying is weird. And I just think it's so funny because I'll be crying and I'll pick up a phone and I'll take a selfie of myself. I'm like, this is so dumb. Or if I'm just going through something or if I'm having a, a moment and I feel like no one's going to understand me, you know, I know she's going to do that. So anyway, I just feel like anytime you can share something that you feel is weak about you with other people, it gives them fuel because it helps them not be alone. And when you no longer feel alone, you feel like you can be mobile because a lot of times you feel immobile when you feel alone because you feel less than and you feel stuck. I just encourage you to continue to share these stories or your experiences that you're having in our group because at the end of the day, we have each other. And I know that you're not going to feel alone because I'm sure a lot of us experience some of the same things. How do you show up as motivated Shanti on an otherwise bad day? Oh my goodness. So there are some times where, you know, I have to film and someone made me so mad. I utilize my anger because I'm not afraid to say I get mad and angry. I don't, these people that's like, oh, don't get mad. You know, I'm like, no, bitch, I'm mad. Um, but I utilize that anger when I'm on stage or when I'm filming because there's nothing better for me that when someone is like really made me mad or I'm in a really bad mood to go into a place where I know that I'm really great and I'm going to show you that I'm really great and it's almost like I'm getting my revenge by showing you how great I really am. And I know that sounds so vain to some people, but you know, back in the day, I would just cuss you the fuck out. I didn't care if I was a motivator, Sean T. There were plenty of times earlier in my career where somebody pissed me off and I'm on set and I'm like, I'm going back to Jersey, Sean T. But I don't do that anymore. I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to utilize this anger because I know that I'm angry and I'm going to utilize this anger and I'm going to show you how great I am. Now, if it's on a, if we talk about the anxiety, if I'm not feeling great at all, oh my goodness, I literally have to get it out somewhere. Again, I have to text a friend, phone a friend, you know, like I'm on who wants to be a millionaire. I have to tell Scott, I have to like, I have to do something to like get it out of my system. But then there are a lot of times where I'm like, it is what it is. And so a lot, you're going to have to see me in my most natural form. And so if that is me being upset or if that's me being emotional, it's what you get. And I just think that that's really important to do sometimes as well. Another, you know, I was talking about social media today with the nurse at the restore place and you know, she asked me, she said, you know, how do you deal with social media? You know, you, you have a big following and people are so mean. I'm like, well, it does bother me sometimes. But now I get to a point, I'm like, well, if that pissed you off, I'm really going to show you more of my personality and I'm going to motivate you through that. And I also believe that, especially nowadays, you know, my social media pages and whatever, what I do and my podcast or whatever I treat it like a party. It's a motivational party. It's a fun party. It's a fast party. It's a messy party. And you can either come or you don't have to come. Because like I talked about in a podcast recently, I'm not one dimensional. Like you guys, you might love Shanti that's pushing you through one of the workouts. And, you know, he, these are all true parts of who I am. I love to inspire people and I love to lift them up and I love to bring them out of like the depths of despair because I've had to do that. But I also like to be messy. Like I love a good booty shot. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, yes, bitch. Like, yes. You know, cause that's going to make me feel good. You know what I, and I just feel like, you know, sometimes I just got to show up as I am, whether I'm motivating you through what I'm going through at the moment, or if I'm motivating you through exercise. Okay.
And the last question, Courtney says, can you go into some detail about what the Unity community is all about? Well, I'm really excited. It's really interesting because there are a lot of spaces online where, you know, maybe just mental health or physical fitness or nutrition. But I just believe that the world right now is in a time where we definitely need to come together no matter what your beliefs are. And we have to really try to understand people and we really have to understand that everyone comes from a different place. We came from two different parents. Most of us are from two different towns or however many towns, maybe from different countries. And so it's just like so important for us to learn from each other. And I believe that if you take out politics and you take out religion and you go into the human experience, we all experience things very similar. We, we all experience, not all of us, but some of us experience the struggle with weight loss. Some of us experience the struggle with mental health. Some of us experience the struggle with our relationships with our parents, our relationships with our kids. Some of us experience trying to make more money and we're struggling with that. And so this group, and I love that it has rooms and I can do just live voice recordings, not necessarily live. So I have to get cute for y'all. You know, we're going to have challenges in here that go deeper than dig deeper nation. We have mental challenges in here. And so it's just a group where, you know, we want to belong and we want to feel like we belong. And we're going to go through everything from fitness to nutrition, to mental health and everything in between. So that's what this group is about. Thank you so much for the question. All right, everyone, that was really fun for me. I hope that you all had a really good time. I think we should do this quite often. I think it's really important that we continue to ask these questions. And while I'm the one that's answering them, I really encourage you to, if you're listening to this podcast, phone a friend and just be okay with talking to someone. I also believe that in our group, the Unity community, you should be able, like if someone reaches out to you because they saw a post, even if you don't have to do a weekly check-in or whatever, but, you know, engage with people, try to give people time. What a lot of people don't understand is when you ask somebody a question or someone asks you a question and you take time to answer that question, you learn a lot about yourself too. And you might give yourself a lot of confidence. I think being able to answer someone's question gives you confidence because it helps you be in some ways introspective and it helps you become honest with yourself because if you really want to help somebody i think that every question that you answer comes from some sort of experience be it education or a personal experience and i think it really opens your mind up to some truth about you too with that said thank you all for joining and i hope you continue to trust and believe in who you are